built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I cannot trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness fills his lovely face, I Together, let's read some scripture from Psalm 46, 8 through 11. With one voice, let's read this together. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress.
that you are with us, that although you could have removed, remained removed and distant from our pain and problems, you actually made a way to join us in the pain and problems through your son, Jesus Christ. And so we, we thank you for that. Thanks for the hope that you've given us through the gospel. And I ask this morning, because we gather as needy people uh, with many problems, many pains, and so I pray that you would meet us through your word, through your spirit, and encourage our hearts, strengthen our hearts, uh, so that we might be a people of peace in a world of panic. So I pray now that you'd give us open eyes, open hearts, open minds, open ears, even as we read your word, that you would strengthen us through the gospel to be a people who shine as a light in a dark world so that more people might be drawn to your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome. A lot of people. What's up, John? A lot of people. Did not expect this many people on a July 4th weekend. So I didn't prepare a sermon because I didn't think anybody would be here. So this is going to be awkward. Uh, kidding. How awful would that be? So glad you're here. Uh, a lot of guests and visitors this weekend. Really grateful that you're here. I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes, but I really, we want you to leave with one thing. Uh, at Hillside, we believe Jesus changes everything. He's done that through the gospel. The gospel is the good news. And Paul said, I make known to you as of first importance the gospel, that Christ died for our sins. That's our greatest problem. Our sin separates us from God and separates us for, from one another. And Christ died for that. He paid for it. Christ was buried, and he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. That takes care of death, uh, the problem that we all have. Jesus has taken care of all of our problems eternally, and he's given us grace to walk through this world of problems. And so if you leave with anything, leave with the truth that Jesus changes everything. Uh, he's changed me. He starts by changing us from the inside out. He's changed me. My name is Dave. I'm a recovering addict and alcoholic. Saved by grace, I have new life in Christ. I'm grateful for that life. So today, if you're here, you don't know Jesus, I, I really am gonna encourage you to submit your life to him and just say, Jesus, I've sinned. Will you forgive me and come live your life in and through me? I wanna put my faith in you. He'll start writing a brand new story with your life. It's astounding. He makes all things new. So we have been walking through the book of Genesis, seeing how Jesus changes everything. The entire Bible's about Jesus. It points to Jesus. The book of Genesis moves, moves us slowly towards 
this hero, this rescuer, this redeemer, this story that God's writing. And so I want you to see it today. Genesis chapter 26. If you'll open up your Bibles, I'm just going to read chapter 26, verses 2, 3, and 4, and show you how, in spite of all of our problems, God's promise progresses. That's really chapter 26 in a nutshell. You're going to see Isaac, he faces problem after problem after problem after problem. And in spite of our problems, God's promise to bring this hero, rescuer, and redeemer progresses. Let me show it to you. Genesis 26, verse 2, 3, 4. God says, Moses writes this, that the Lord appeared to Isaac and said to Isaac, do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I'll tell you. Sojourn in this land and I'll be with you and I'll bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath or the covenant which I swore to your father Abraham. And I'll multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven. And I'll give your descendants all these lands and by your descendants, all of the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And so that promise that was given to Abraham is now transferred to Isaac and this plan of redemption, of salvation, the coming of the Messiah continues on in spite of all the problems that we're going to see today in the life of Isaac. So before we get into this chapter, let me give you a broad theological perspective that as we walk through, you can hang your thoughts on. If you read straight through the Bible, one of the character attributes, the truths about God that you would see is that God is a God of peace. 2 Thessalonians 3.16, may the Lord of peace himself grant you or give you peace in every circumstance. This is the state of wholeness. In the Old Testament, we'd call it shalom, completeness. Where as a human, you know, God has taken care of all that I need eternally. I'm whole in him and I don't need anything else. You're just, you're at peace, at rest. Now, there's a small theological picture that runs through the Bible as well, because uh, philosophically, theologically, intellectually, peace is great, is it not? Like, I can grasp it intellectually. The problem is that we live in a world where sin is infected and infused everything, and sin brings problems, doesn't it? I mean, wherever sin remains, problems abound. We live in a world of problems. We're surrounded by problems. I think this, well, let me just ask. Let me survey the crowd to see if I can connect. Has anyone here ever had a problem? <laughs> okay. Is anyone here currently in a problem? Okay. Is anyone here just coming out of a problem? And how many of you anticipate coming into problems later on today? <laughs> I joke. I play. I have. This world is like a conveyor belt of problems. Um, like that, to connect with some of my more mature crowd, that, that show, I Love Lucy, anybody grew up watching that? She got this job at a chocolate factory. It was a conv <laughs> you've seen it. That's a picture of life, yo. Like they're in there and the, the chocolates start coming out slow and she's like, oh, this is so easy. And then the chocolates just start pouring out and she's shoving them in her mouth because if any chocolate goes uh, off the conveyor belt unwrapped, they're fired. So they just start tossing chocolates, putting chocolates in their pockets. Life is like a conveyor belt of problems for all of us. Nobody escapes it. And if we don't learn how to deal with problems, we're going to be in even bigger problems. The problem with problems is that not all problems are created equal. They're not. Problems are like a box of chocolates. You've got to squeeze them to figure out what kind of problem is this? Here's the good news before we jump into chapter 26 where we're going to see Isaac has five different types of problems in one chapter. The good news is that God knew that we were going to have problems. And he, he loved us so much that he sent his son, the Prince of Peace, who was born. God humbled. Jesus is God. He humbled himself, emptied himself, and joined us in this conveyor belt of problems. He didn't deny problems. He actually lived in the midst of them. And he purchased peace with God through his blood so that we might be a people of peace. We might have the Holy Spirit who grows us in peace, that we might live at peace and be peacemakers in this world of problems. Today, as we walk through chapter six, uh, we're gonna answer that question again. 
How do we live, love, and lead in a postmodern, secular, humanist world that has clung to moral relativism and is just overwhelmed with problems? Christian, how do we live, love, and lead in that world? How do we raise our kids in that world? It is crazy out there. One of the answers the scripture gives to us comes from Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. That when you realize that Jesus is, the Prince of Peace is greater than all our problems, the peace of God rules in your heart and you begin to be a peacemaker in a world of problems and panic. I'll show you today as we walk through this. I'm going to give you five rules for the rough road ahead. And that's a lot of points for a sermon, I know. I tried to reduce it. I actually did reduce it from 12 down to five. So I'm proud of me. You may think five is too many rules, but watch how this plays out. It's astounding. I'm gonna show you today that some problems are circumstantial. And if you've got your Hillside app, I I outlined all this for you because I know five points is a lot. Typically, we can't remember three. Well, typically, we can't even remember where our keys are, (laughs) honestly. That's why preaching, God calls it the foolishness of preaching, because we forget 98% of what we hear. But I'm going to give you five rules. I'm going to, I'm going to delineate the different kinds of problems. So we're going to take each problem like a, a chocolate and break it open, see if there's coconut in there or cherry. We're going to look for the caramel ones, because those are the good ones, amen? Those are the ones you look for. And I am grateful now. They label chocolates. Isn't that a blessing when they started doing that? I'm hungry, it's almost lunch. I don't know why I'm talking about that. Some problems are circumstantial. Some problems, hey Siri, got it. Some problems are character problems, they're inside of us. Some problems are confusing problems, we can't figure them out. Some problems are clarifying problems, they let us see what's inside our hearts and somebody else's hearts. Some problems are constant. You're not gonna be able to get away from them. So what do you do with different problems. Let's jump in, jump in, and I'll show you. There's just a beautiful, beautiful picture of that. But the centerpiece of this text, chapter 26, is that God's plan progresses in spite of all, all of our problems. We're going to jump in and get a little nitty-gritty and look at the problems, but I want you to know God's plans are not hindered by our problems. They just move on. So let's look at circumstantial problems. Look at verse 1. It starts out with a famine. I'll show it to you. Verse 1 This is a circumstantial problem. Now, there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine that had happened during the time of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar and to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. Some problems are just circumstantial. There's nothing you can do about it. It's nobody's fault. They're just part of living in a fallen world. You can't blame anybody. I want you to notice this is before we even thought about global warming and there was a famine. (laughs) Like you can't blame people's carbon footprint. Famines are part of living in a fallen world. And I know that was uncomfortable after. It's like, can we we joke about that? (laughs) It's true. Like we all want somebody to blame. Like whose fault is the famine, right? Somebody's doing something wrong, driving their car too much. There are circumstantial problems that happen in this world because of the fall. Stuff happens. Write that down. That's the Christianese version of the Forrest Gump saying. But stuff happens all the time. For the Tooker family, it tends to happen during vacation. Right? It just does. It's nobody's fault. This last vacation we went on, Two days into it, I started breaking out with the shingles. I didn't know they were shingles, but I had this nerve pain shooting down my leg. So I thought it was sciatic, but I was getting shingles. And then I had a staph infection in my elbow that was getting worse and worse and worse that I ended up having to find a doctor to do surgery on because I almost went septic. It wouldn't move anymore. And so then I drove down because I had problems. There were circumstantial problems, but I was like, I've got to do something about this. So I listed my problems, and I was like, okay, I can, I can go to a chiropractor and maybe take care of the nerve pain. I drove down to the chiropractor, and my car broke down in a different state in a different city while going to the chiropractor. It was a new car. It's horrible. It's like, what in the world? This was the same day I was supposed to get surgery on my elbow to deal with the, the staph infection. 
So I then had to go find a mechanic in a different town. And all the mechanics were like, you're from out of town. We're not going to work on your car. It's horrible. I finally found a mechanic who's like, no, I'm not going to work on your car. I said, will you just look at it? He came and looked at it. As soon as he touched it, it broke and coolant went everywhere. And I said, you broke it. You, you bought it. I'm not moving my car, literally, or else I couldn't have got my car worked on. But then I was like, now I can't move my car. I've got to go get surgery. What should I do? And he's like, I don't know. I said, what would you do? He said, I would have planned better. <laughs> I said, okay, Karen, thanks for that. That's not helpful information, <laughs> right? That's no, and I, I said, who plans for their car to break down? That's not helpful. Literally, what would you do? Is there an Uber? No, no Uber, no Lyft, no taxis. I've got shingles. I'm about to have surgery. I said, but there's got to be some way. He's like, about three quarters of a mile, you can rent a bike. I said, a motorcycle? No, a bicycle. <laughs> so I walked three quarters of a mile, rented a bicycle, drove to the hospital, rode my bike to the hospital, and it was like a Pee Wee Herman bike, one of those really goofy ones. <laughs> got surgery. The doctor's like, uh, who's coming to pick you up? I said, nobody. My car broke down. I've got a Pee Wee Herman bike. I'm going to ride home. <laughs> Some stuff just happens. Problems happen. But here's what I want you to know. Here's rule for the road, the rough road, number one. When problems happen, number one, remember. Remember. The Prince of Peace is greater than your problems. He'll provide something. Remember. Because when problems happen, we tend to freak out. God, where are you? You don't care. The Prince of Peace is greater than your problems. He will provide. Now, it might be a Pee Wee Herman bike. It's not generally what you expect, but he will provide. Rule number one, during problems, write it down. Remember, the Prince of Peace is greater than your problems. You'll notice in verse 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, even during the famine and the problem, God directs Isaac exactly where he needs to go. Remember that the Prince of Peace is greater than your problems. Now, Rule number one about problems actually causes a problem for me. And if I was just sitting in your seat, I would say, okay, remember that the Prince of Peace is greater than your problems. That's great. But that actually frustrates me because I believe that the Prince of Peace is greater than my problems. So why doesn't he remove them? Amen? He knows it. He sees it. He cares. He's greater than the problems to so remove the problem. I'm glad you say that. Let's go to rule number two. Look at verse seven. So God moves Isaac down to Gerar. Verse seven, on his way down there, watch if this sounds familiar, because this is going to bring up problem number two, character problems. When the men of the place asked Isaac about his wife, <laughs> chapter 12, chapter 20, hey, Isaac, tell us about your wife. Isaac said, she is my, anybody heard that before? In fact, this is deja vu in the same place, the same location with the same people just about 60 years later. Isaac says, well, she's my wife, thinking the men of the place might kill him on account of Rebekah, for she was beautiful. Some problems aren't circumstantial. We actually cause them. Some problems are character problems. Anybody ever had a character problem? Okay, every hand should go up because none of us are fully sanctified yet. <laughs> Anybody here that has been perfected in love, joy, peace, patience? I mean, that's enough. I can just stop there. I don't have to go through the whole list of the fruit of the Spirit, right? I don't love perfectly. Does anyone else here? Okay, we, then I've got a character problem. Some problems are character problems, and God allows them, brings them in order to form us. But in order to form us, oftentimes God has to squeeze the stupid out of me. Amen? Anybody else? See, I'm like, why is this problem here? God's like, I love you so much, I have to squeeze stupid to the surface so that you'll carry out rule number two of the rough road. Rule number one, remember that the Prince of Peace is greater than your problem. Rule number two is, is very easy, it's just the stress test rule. We use stress tests a lot. Stress tests show the weakness in any system. We use them in engineering. We use them in financial systems. We, we use them in cardiology. You'll put a poor dude on a, on a uh, treadmill. Why would you do that? Doctors, why would, 
well, it's good. We've got to see where their heart fails. Really? That's a thing. It's a stress test because it shows where the system's weak. Do you know that God loves you so much, he will stress test you because he wants you to see where the weakness is. I have character deficiencies. I don't love well. I'm not joyful all the time. Can you believe that? <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not peaceful all the time. I'm not, I'm not very patient. God allows the stress test to squeeze stupid to the surface so that I might see it, so I can follow rule number two. Rule number two is repent. During problems, God is going to bring something to the surface. And by his grace, for his glory, you can confess that sin. That's not good. And you can be contrite over your sin and say, my sin has hurt you. And then you can change. And the problem really will form you to look more and more like Jesus Christ. So rule number one, the Prince of Peace is greater than your problems. He really is. Rule number two, repent. There's always a purpose in the problem. He's so good, your problem doesn't come without purpose. There's always a purpose. He wants to grow you. That's painful, yes, and it's profitable because he wants you to look like Jesus. So God uses this test. He squeezes, and by the way, just write it down, like father, like son. What I do not allow Jesus to transform in my life will be transmitted to my kids. Do you think that Abraham taught Isaac how to lie? Do you you think that Abraham was like, listen, son, I've just got this favorite lie I like to tell. I like to tell people your mom's my sister. It's just a thing, (laughs) right? It's just a thing. And you should probably do that too because it's a lot of fun. Mom got taken twice, once by Pharaoh, once by Abimelech. You should try it. Do you think Abraham ever taught... See, we don't have to teach our kids. Most of Christianity is caught, not taught. Our kids pick it up, and what I refuse to let Jesus transform and squeeze out of me will be transmitted to my kids. Repent. That's rule number two. Contrition, brokenness, change. Now watch rule number three. Some problems are just confusing. You'll never figure it out. As long as you look at it, it will confound you. It will confuse you because some problems are hidden in other people's hearts. Watch verse, I think it's, uh, is it 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Here comes a confusing problem. Watch this problem. Now Isaac sowed in that land and Watch, here's the blessing. He sowed in that land, the land of Gerar, and he reaped in the same year how much? A hundredfold. Anybody got a 401k that's ever given a hundredfold back in here? Like, that's an investment plan, is it not? Like, I would invest with these cats. This is good. And the Lord blessed him. Watch 13. Here's how much. The man became, you say it? Fat bank. And continued to grow fatter bank until he became Super duper fat bank, cash, clams, ducats, dollars. It's all rolling in. The Lord's blessing him big time. Watch 14. He had, he had possessions of flocks and herds, great household, a lot of servants. So that rule of first mention, this is the first time this word is mentioned in the Bible. He had fat bank, a lot of herds, a lot of flocks, a lot of household servants, so that purpose clause, the Philistines, what? What's envy? Jealousy is another word of, it's like a kinder way of saying envy. Envy is a little deeper. C.S. Lewis would call it the insatiable sin. How many of you have ever gone to somebody and say, please forgive me, I'm filled with envy? It's not really, it's astounding. We would put it also in the, the term of coveting, which makes the top 10, God's top 10 list. It's a big, big deal, but we don't talk about it much. We leave it in the darkness. To envy is to see something someone else has and be filled with discontent and resent at the fact that they have it better than you do. That's envy. You see someone else has more than you have, so you are filled with discontent. I'm no longer happy where I'm at and what I have. And resent. I don't like you now because you make me feel bad about me. This actually starts with little bitties. You ever seen a child, they have one toy and they're super duper happy with their toy, playing with their toy, but then they look across the nursery and that child has 
two toys. And now they're not content with the toy they have, and they have to go over and bonk the other kid and steal his toy. It's called envy. I'm convinced none of us have matured past the nursery, and we still live this way. And when we walk into this, watch what happens. So the Philistines are filled with envy. Watch what they say, verse 15. Now, all the wells that his father and servants had dug in the days of Abraham, the fa uh, his father, the Philistines, stopped up by filling them with earth. Verse 16, then Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us for you're too powerful for us. We're filled with envy. The fact that God is blessing you makes us feel discontented and resent. We need you gone. Watch what Isaac does here, verse 17. And Isaac departed. He said, okay. And he went. That's unfair. He's got to be confused. He's just, he, he just sowed and reaped a hundredfold. Everything's going well. He's a super nice dude. I'm sure he's going to tell the Philistines, follow God. He'll meet all of your needs. But the Philistines look at him and said, go away. The truth is, sometimes problems are confusing because they're just about God's faithfulness to shine a light to lost people. Sometimes your problems are going to make no sense to you. God's gonna bless you, things are gonna go well, everything's going well, marriage is going well, family's going well, and you'll be confused because other people will say, I want nothing to do with you, go away from me. Now, here's what you need to know about that. We live in a pin the tail on the donkey world. Anybody ever play pin the tail on the donkey? Yeah, you, spin, you, you blindfold these kids, you spin them around, and then you set them free with this tack, a, a tail on a tack to go pin the tail on the donkey. We live in a world where somebody has to be to blame for everything wrong in my life. If something's wrong in my life, somebody has to be to blame. If I'm discontent, there's gotta be somebody I can blame. If I'm, if, if I'm filled with resent, it's gotta be somebody else's fault. We just call this political system. We used to call news, news, because it dealt with who, what, when, where, why, and how. They called that journalism. It's astounding now. I read all kinds of different sites just to see what journalism's turned into. It's no longer news. It's about who's to blame. These people did that wrong, therefore we're, we're pinning the, the tail of blame on them. And it's crept into the church. We think that there's something wrong. Surely there's somebody to blame. The fact of the matter is, some problems will always confuse you. There's nobody to blame. God's just using you to Motel 6 this thing and leave the light on for the world. I've got bad news and good news. Bad news is, in this world, you will be hated. That's bad news. But even worse news, it's not just Christians who are gonna be hated. Do you know there's enough hate to go around for everybody? You'll be hated for being white, some of you. Were you in control of that? No, you were just born. Some of you will be hated for being black. Some of you will be hated for being rich. Some of you will be hated for being poor, but you will be hated. Some of you will be hated for being tall. Some of you will be hated for being short. Some of you will be hated for being in shape. Some of you will be hated for being more healthy. <laughs> I didn't know what to say there, Johnny. I just had to go with it. Uh, but you will be hated. You don't even know this, but you'll be hated just for being a Texan. There, a couple of you have. Travel. Leave Texas every now and then. People ask, I, and that's hard because Texas is huge. And I've had to tell people that when I fly. I'm getting ready to fly tomorrow. I'm going on vacation with my son. So I'm sure someone will ask, where are you from? Where are you from? Texas. Oh. <laughs> Everything's bigger in Texas. Yeah, actually, that's a scientific statement of fact. <laughs> like, I have to tell people that's literally true. It really is. Like, things actually are bigger. Don't know why. And I'll ask them, where are you from? And it's happened. I'm from Rhode Island. And I say, oh, everything's little bitty there. You're like a belly button. <laughs> it's tiny. Your state's tiny. Your cars are tiny. You're going to be hated. That's the bad news. 
And there's so much pin the tail on the donkey going on. Where's the blame gonna go? They'll blame. We get to live in a world where we get to choose what we're gonna be hated for. Choose well, choose well. You're gonna hate me. Let me pinpoint what you can hate me for. I believe that the Bible's God's word. I believe that it's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father but by him. I believe that salvation is a gift of grace obtained through faith in Christ Jesus alone. I believe that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for anyone who believes. And I believe that Jesus is the hope of the world. Hate me for that. I'll receive that joyfully. You wanna hate me for my political party? I'm not gonna suffer for that. It's nonsense. Hate me because I love Jesus and love you. Some problems are confusing. Why do they hate me? Because God blessed you. They're filled with envy. What do I do when the problems are confusing and someone envies you and is discontent and filled with resent? Rule number three, sometimes you just gotta rest. You just rest in Jesus. You didn't cause the problem. You didn't create the problem. You you can't cure the problem. You just cuddle up with Jesus and you rest. You just rest and say, Lord, I'd rather not be in the midst of this problem, but it's here. Jesus is gonna say, just remember, little one, Remain pleasant during the problem. Remain pleasant. Don't you return evil for evil. You be a blessing. Somebody hates you. Jesus, in fact, in Matthew would say, great is your reward in heaven. If you just remain pleasant and a peacemaker during this problem, you don't repay evil for evil. Great is your reward in heaven. So that's rule number three. Sometimes you just got to rest. Some problems are clarifying, though. Watch this. We'll go verse 18, 19, 20. Verse 18, here's the clarifying part. You know problems are gonna show you what's inside a person? Problems are gonna clarify what's inside you, what's inside of them. Watch what happens here, it's astounding. Then Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the same names which his father had given him. This is no small task to dig a well. Some of these were 30 feet diameter. I mean, they were huge. This was months of work. So Isaac digs them up. Um, Watch verse 19. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley, they found there a well of flowing water, uh, living water in the Hebrew. It was just running water, so it didn't have mosquitoes or any of the nasty stuff that grows. So that's good water. Watch 20. Watch what happens here. The herdsmen of uh, Gerar did what? They quarreled with him. They quarreled with him and, and, and saying, The water is ours. Well, did they dig it? No, did they do any of the work? No, they're just being foolish and causing problems. Why do some people cause problems? Some people always gotta be causing problems. So he named the well Esek or contention because there was contention, because they contended with him. Now watch 21, watch what he does with this. So they moved away, They, they dug another well, and guess what? They quarreled over it too, so he named it Sitna or Enmity. He's like, you gotta be kidding me. Now we dug another well, and now we got more problems. So watch 22, watch what they do with this. So he moved away from there, he moved again. This is the third move. That's problems. How many of you like moving? It's a favorite hobby of yours, pastime in the weekend. It's like, hey, let's pack up the U-Haul just for fun. It's horrible, isn't it? This is the third time. He moves again. They dug another well. And this time, they didn't quarrel over it. So he named it Rehoboth, for he said, at last the Lord has made room for us, and we will will be fruitful in the land. Some problems are clarifying, super clarifying, because in the problem, when stupid gets squeezed to the surface, you're going to get to see what's in your heart, and you're going to get to see what's in somebody else's heart. See, we think we know who people are. You don't know who somebody is until there's pressure, until that stress test is applied. And when that stress test is applied and stupid is squeezed to the surface, you say, oh, that's who I'm dealing with. And kids, you need to know this. This may be, number four may be the best rule. Not everyone is the same inside. Not everyone's the same inside. 
In fact, Proverbs would outline three different kinds of people. Typically, as Americans, we keep who we really are hidden. We do. Um, because it's not beneficial to let who we really are out. If we let who we really are out, it would, we'd be walking around saying, hey, I want to use you, abuse you, hurt you, harm you, take from you. I don't want to love you. I actually want uh, to be a vampire and take from you. So we learn to keep all of that in. Proverbs says there's three kinds of people. There are people who are oriented towards wisdom. That is, they seek to walk in the light. They seek counsel. They seek truth. And when the truth and light come, guess what the person oriented towards wisdom does? They change. They adjust to the light when the light comes. Proverbs says there's a second kind of person. It's called a fool. They're oriented towards foolishness. Proverbs says if you correct a fool, you'll get blows for yourself. He says, don't correct a fool in his folly lest you be like him. In fact, when the light comes to a fool, guess what the fool does? He busts the light bulb and says, how dare you bring a light bulb? You should be ashamed of yourself. The fool will change the light. So some people, they're oriented towards wisdom. They want to know truth because reality is our friend. Some people are oriented towards foolishness. They change the light, they change the truth, they change the story, and they'll bust you up for telling them anything they don't want to hear. Some people are oriented towards evil. And the Bible says the evil man has destruction in his heart. He thinks of violence when he lays on his bed. Do you know you don't deal with people the same? If you're, if you're dealing with a wise man, you just speak to them because the wise man's listening. If you're dealing with a fool, you stop talking because the, the fool never listens. You're wasting your words. And, and if you're dealing with an evil person, call 911. That's why I keep Chief Gary on speed dial. Because evil people just pull out a Glock and take you out. They've got violence in their, their heart. Not everybody is the same inside. What Isaac does here is brilliant. It's actually what you learn in physics. This is going to be clarifying for a lot of you. In physics, they talk about force. Force equals mass times acceleration. F equals MA. There's five different kinds of force. What we deal with, see, God has given us natural law so that we might understand spiritual truths and spiritual law. Oftentimes, when you're in conflict with somebody, what happens, you begin trying to work it out, and two people get in conflict and it's called friction force or contact force or lean to. Uh, ever, anybody ever made a fort with their kids and you lean to cushions from the couch against each other? And you've got a lean to. This happens in conflict where you begin to conflict with somebody, but the conflict never resolves because you're pushing and they're pushing. It's friction force. Um, these arguments can never be settled. That's why some of you have been arguing since clear back in the Carter administration, the same argument. Right? You're still talking about stuff that happened uh, during the Watergate era with Nixon, and you're still fighting about it. Um, the truth is that sometimes, do you see what Isaac did here? They quarreled, he moved. They quarreled, he moved. They quarreled, he moved until there was nothing less left to quarrel about. Rule number four is sometimes you have to remove yourself. Matthew chapter 12. Jesus, they tested him. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They were testing him. Jesus asked them a question. They go, the religious leaders go through this whole rigmarole. Jesus heals the guy. And all of a sudden, the Pharisees, they planned to murder Jesus. So he removed himself from them. He withdrew from them. You see, sometimes you've just got to remove yourself because in physics, if you remove half of that lean-to, guess what happens to the argument? Boom. It falls. You need to know that some people need quarrel. Some people need drama. Some people need dysfunction. Let me speak to you as a recovering fool. In my foolishness and folly, I need a fight. I'm planning on, on drinking tonight. I just need a reason to do it and justify my sin. So sometimes it's somebody making me mad on 281. Oh, that person made me mad. They made me drink. Shame on them. Literally, that was, that's our thought process as a fool. I can't believe they did that. Shame on them. They made me drink. They made me use. They made me angry. They made... See, 
the fool always needs conflict to feel good about their sin. And this is why some of you, you're in those quarrels, you're in those conflicts. Rule number four, sometimes you need to remove yourself and let the fool fall flat on their face. Watch rule number five. I'm, I'm eight minutes over. I'm so sorry, John. I'm so, okay, watch this. I'll land the plane in four minutes. Five, price six. <laughs> Point number five, go to verse 34 and 35. Some problems are circumstantial. You got to remember the Prince of Peace is greater. Some problems are character. You got to repent. Some problems are confusing. You got to rest. Some problems are clarifying. You got to rem remove yourself because you're dealing with a fool or an evil person. Some problems are constant. Watch 34 and 35. When Esau, Isaac's firstborn son, was 40 years old, so it's 40 years since chapter 25, he married Judith the daughter of Biri the Hittite, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Now watch verse 35. This is so sad. And they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. This is in the continual tense. He married two Hittite gals that his dad said, don't marry. They moved next door to Isaac and Rebekah, and they brought continual grief grief. What do you do when the problem you face is constant? We have problems like that, don't we? We don't like talking about it because it tends to do with our marriage, our family, or our kids. But there's a constant grief that's brought to our heart. It's why Christmas and Easter and Thanksgiving are so difficult because we're back around family and there's constant grief. We don't like talking about it because we don't know what to do about it. It's just going to be there. In, in English, we would say it is what it is, right? You got an HOA, and other than moving, there's no way to get around it. It is what it is. So what do you do when you can't change the problem? It's constant. It's the fruitcake principle. How many of you have ever eaten a fruitcake? How come we don't? Nobody likes to talk about the fruitcake. <laughs> How many of you have ever gifted a fruitcake to someone? Dan, have you? How many of you have ever gotten a fruitcake and re-gifted it? <laughs> That's good. Fruitcake's the most amazing gift ever because the shelf life on it is about 426 years. <laughs> so for, for you preppers, just buy a bunch of fruitcake. It'll be good forever. Fruitcake principle is this. We, and we teach our kids this. Sometimes God gives us gifts we don't want, like fruitcake. When someone gives your kids a gift that they don't like, as parents, we teach kids, when somebody gives you a gift, parents, what do we tell our kids to say? Yeah. And, and we'll coach our kids. Hey, they're going to give you a gift. You may not like it. It may be like a fruitcake. Doesn't matter what it is. Could be a rock. Could be a brick. You look them in the eye and you say, thank you. Kids do the darndest things, and they say the darndest things. They'll get a gift, and they'll be like, don't like it. That's stupid. Should have gotten me. What I really wanted was this Lego set. And they just let it out. And as a parent, you're mortified, aren't you? You're like, oh, I'm so sorry. So it's epic parent fail. Do you know that God sometimes gives us gifts we don't like because he loves us? He'll give us, he'll give us fruitcake. What do you do when God gives you a fruitcake, a constant problem that is what it is and it's not going away? Rule number five, you rejoice and you say thank you. You rejoice always, you pray without ceasing and you give thanks in everything, not for everything. I'm not grateful for cancer. I'm not grateful for brokenness. I'm not grateful for these things. You give thanks in all things. You say, but Dave, that won't change it. That doesn't change the circumstance. No, but it'll change you. It will change you because you'll begin to look at the Prince of Peace and say, I believe everything that you've brought is for my good, your glory, and I'm going to learn to rejoice in the midst of this because you're using it to make me look more and more like Jesus Christ. You see, let me land the plane here. Jesus changed everything by entering our world of problems you know, Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. He entered all of our problems. He knows all about our problems. He was a man of grief, acquainted with grief, acquainted with sorrow, a man that struggled and loved perfectly. 
In John 16, 33, he says, these things I've spoken to you so that in me you might have peace. In this world, you're gonna have problems, but take heart because I overcame the world. You see, he's entered our problems and he's overcome our problems by saying, this is my body, which is for you. He became sin to take away your greatest problem. He said, this is my blood that was shed for you. His blood took care of your eternal problem. It cleansed you. He says, I've taken care of your greatest problem, your eternal problem, and I've promised to be with you always through every problem. Just remember, Prince of Peace is greater than your problems. Repent when you need to repent. Rejoice in all your struggles because your Savior is there with you. Let's celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper now. We'll celebrate how Jesus overcame all our problems. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gospel, the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray that as we walk through this valley of the shadow of death filled with problems, that you would give us your peace, that peace that surpasses all comprehension because of the good news of Jesus Christ, that we we would remember, Jesus, that you are greater than our problems, that we would repent where repentance was needed, that we would rest in you, that when you lead us to, that we would remove ourselves, but in all things, that we we would rejoice because you're such a good Savior to us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we prepare to take communion, we want to make sure that if anybody got in and missed the elements and wants to take communion, would you just raise your hand? We have ushers that will come by and make sure you get the elements. Just leave your hands up while people are coming by. Two notes of housekeeping, I guess. You may have the old communion cup or you may have the new communion cup. The old communion cup has two pull-off tops. So you wanna be really careful to take off the first one to get to the bread. And if you have the new communion cup, it's two-sided. So be sure to open the bread side first, okay? As Dave was just talking about peace and how Jesus gave his life to restore peace, to give it to us. It's because something was wrong and it's the sin that we've all experienced. In the beginning of Genesis, when God made something, if you remember this at the end, he always said it was good when it was done, right? And Jesus came to make those things that were once good, good again. And the worship team, we actually wrote a song called Good Again that we're gonna use right now as sort of the communion message. So if you wanna sing this from where you're seated, you can. If you just wanna listen to the words and let it minister over you, please let that happen. This is gonna be how we prepare our hearts to receive communion. Father made the universe from the fullness of his love. Creation groaned and from the dirt, life was springing up. And it was good. The breath he gave to flesh and blood was spotless by design and God was there to walk with us in perfect paradise and it was good but sin and death would enter in we've been hiding ever since Jesus 
Son of God took on the grave, a perfect sacrifice. He broke the curse, and by His grace, we are justified. He is good. His Spirit lives inside of us. The old passed away and by his love he's raising up new life in its place he is good all our hope is found in him sin and death can never received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Precious blood of Christ speaks 
precious blood of Christ it's rewriting my history we're forgiven sins forgotten it covers me with destiny our home is with Jesus in eternity it's making all things right the precious blood of Christ it's rewriting my history blood of Christ is rewriting my history. It covers me with destiny. Thank you, Lord. It's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ is singing out with life. It's shouting The blood of Jesus has taken us from enemies to saints, to those who were rebellion to completely and utterly forgiven. Gives us hope, peace, joy, patience. It increases grace over grace on top of us, like waves that never end. And Jesus did that so that we could be his own sons and daughters. Isn't that good? Let's just praise the Lord for that. Thank you, Jesus. (laughs) 